hypnotizer by the Jordan Road. Verse 13, but the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer is heard. What prayer? And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Well, I know what they weren't praying for, for no one at that age is praying for a baby. They were praying for the Messiah to come. They wanted to know, verse 66, what kind of child will this be? As soon as Zachariah gave him the name John, he could speak after nine months of total silence. What kind of child is this? What's it going to be? And there's not a parent that hasn't looked at that little baby in their arms for the first time and sometimes wonder, what will this child grow up to be? Zechariah and Elizabeth didn't need to wonder. God had already told them what this child was going to be. Let's read it. Let's back up to verse 13 again. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. For your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And when he will turn, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord of their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the unjust. And now here it is. Here's the real mission of that child. Sabbath Church. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, yeah. It is a nice day. Woke up and it was, uh, we were stepping outside to leave and I re recognized the puddles outside. We got some good moisture. Looks like y'all got some good moisture as well. I heard it. That was, that was just the other day. Yeah, that was the other day. Well, you got, it, it, it looked, uh, it looked like Austin. You know, I mean, that, that's not going to last long, but I was happy to see all the moisture. Uh, summer long has been brown, and now it's starting to green up, make you feel a little bit better about life, you know, the green grass. Um, so I know going out there towards Wayso and, uh, Wayso, Wayside and uh, Barbara Park, and all that green grass probably starting to pop up. So it's probably a nice drive. And uh, so it's a blessing to get this rain, and maybe you can uh, get a fall garden going. Maybe, maybe it's about that time. You know, I've been doing some research and uh, about money, and I don't know if you know this, but there's roughly uh, 300 trillion. The world is 300 trillion dollars in debt. The world, you know, the United States is somewhere maybe 20, 21. Who knows? But the world at whole is uh, 300 trillion. That's a lot of money. I can't fathom. And then they said there's uh, roughly one quintillion dollars within floating around in the stock market gambling. So uh, I can't fathom that amount of money. The reason why I, I tell you this this day is simply thinking about this quote. Charles uh, said it was here last week, and I think God really wants us to understand this in uh, in line with Matthew six thirty one. Through 33 it says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? 
For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you, as what are given to you as well. And here it says, when we take into our hands the management of things with which we have to do, and depend upon our own wisdom for success. We are taking a burden which God has not given us and are trying to bear it without His aid. We are taking upon ourselves a responsibility that belongs to God and thus are really putting ourselves in His place. We may well have anxiety and anticipate danger and loss, for it is certain to befall us. But when we really believe that God loves us and means to do us good, we shall cease to worry about the future. We shall trust God as a child trusts another parent. Then our troubles and torments will disappear, for our will is swallowed up in the will of God. And I think that's very prevalent for us, especially as Christians in these last days. I mean, I'm not an economist, but all the other, it just sure looked like to me that the economy is getting ready to fail. And they're saying it's getting ready to fail. And right now, don't let it be too late to really trust in these things that are being said and put your trust in God and know that, yes, uh, trouble are going to come, but it's okay because you have a Father in Heaven who loves you more than the sparrows, who will provide a home and food for you. Even though Jesus Himself didn't have a place to rest His, leg, uh, rest his head, He will make sure you have a place to rest your head because He loves you that much. And I think we need to really get that under uh, it, it settled it into our beliefs. Uh, these are your announcements. Welcome back to worship. There is no fellowship lunch today. Of course, with all the things that are going on in the world, uh, they don't want us singing. I don't know if we can still sing. But they say that it's, we're going to sing anyway, though. And Nathan was here. And, uh, it's always good to have Nathan here to play the, uh, the music. Um, Right. So it looks like maybe September, maybe the end of September, who knows. Uh, there is a lot of things going on, but uh, with the last potluck we did have, it was a wonderful, it was just a wonderful Saturday that day. And uh, Lord willing, those come around soon and we can get back to a kind of normalcy. Uh, food bank is this week. Um, at Tuesday, beginning at 5 p.m., there is no Sunday night Bible class. There may not be no Sunday night Bible class for the rest of the month or of August, depending on uh, how situated uh, things get uh, with the Menards. Uh, they're in a transition period right now, and so uh, Sunday night Bible class is not this uh, is not tomorrow. It may not be for the rest of the month. The Lord willing, uh, things get situated. Uh, Thursday night Bible study is at 6 p.m. Uh, Brothers and sisters, remember, uh, this is a blessing for you and I. Uh, it is imperative that we do guard the edges of the Sabbath. With that being said, sundown is at 8.50 today. Tomorrow it is at 8.43 p.m. Please stand for the doxology. Praise God for bless us. Bless us with the presence of your Spirit, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. And that all that we say and do will bring honor and glory to you. This is our prayer in Christ's name. We pray. Amen. Amen. May we see you. Please turn with me to Proverbs 3. Verses 1 through 4, Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 4. And I would just like to make mention, I want to claim these promises 
right now today in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. When you're there, please say amen. Amen. It says, My son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. For a length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them up. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thy heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God. Amen. You know, I was telling my wife all day Saturday that these hands are blessed hands. Just yesterday, these hands laid some tile. Now, it, uh, it, it wasn't the best tile you ever seen laid, but they got it done. These hands barred it. These hands truck dry. These hands do a little bit of welding. These hands do a lot. They do dishes. They do a little cooking. They do a little cleaning, these hands. These hands also birth children. And I'm so thankful that God has blessed me with these hands. These, God, God, is a, God has blessed my wife so much. You know, these, you know I, make, I make a lot of my hands. But we all know it's, it's the Lord. It's, it's, it's the angels around us. And, uh, you know, early Saturday morning, uh, you know, I, I got tired. I'll tell you what, I got tired Wednesday of hearing about contractions. So I don't want to hear about no more contractions. I want to hear about them no more. Uh, and it, it's not, been, it's not, and you like, oh, that's, that's, that's kind of mean for you to say. Maybe, maybe. But I was saying it from the standpoint of this baby's coming right now. This baby's got to come. And I was saying, let's just let it come when it wants to come. You know, so that's what I mean by it. Uh, when I say I was tired of hearing about contractions, let's just be patient and wait for the baby to come. And that was on Wednesday. Um, nevertheless, on sa Saturday, uh, I was in a deep sleep, and it's hard to wake me up. And uh, Jessica was in the tub saying, hey, hey. I woke up, and she says, help me out of the tub. I didn't even know she was in the tub. She said, help me out of the tub. And it, was, it seemed like it was go time, and it was go time. And uh, you know, Jessica usually has uh, quick labors, and this time it was very quick. And the child, you know, we, we've been praying, and, this last day, we were told we uh, no one knew we was going to have the baby at home. A lot of people knew we was going to have the baby at home. No one knew we was going to have an unassisted birth. And we didn't tell anybody because we didn't want anybody to worry, especially her mom, because she she's a worrying person. We didn't want her to worry. And uh, we told we told some people. They were like, "What if all this is happening?" And I told Jessica, "What if everything? What if God just actually blessed us?" What if that happens? What if God blessed us? We're not going to, you know, let's, let's, we can play the what if game all day. What if this happens? What if that happens? So we said, what if God blessed us? You know, we thought about teenage girls are out here having birth and putting their kids in the dumpsters and those babies are surviving. That's not right. But my point is, is it, it's, it's God. It's, it's God who, God's going to bless who, uh, and have, he's going to have mercy and blessings on them whom he has mercy and blessings on. And we being uh, people of God, we said, why not us? And we knew uh, just with everything going on at the hospital, we said, you know, with the stress that they usually do cause, uh, we said to ourselves, we think this will be the best route to go. And then we went with a midwife, and then I, we, we, we considered her, I think she may have been a smoker, and you know, so on and so forth. So it didn't really, we didn't, we didn't like how that, how that went. So we prayed about it and we decided to go assisted, assisted with the Holy Spirit and the angels of God. That's, that's what we said. And so long story short, or long story over, however you want to say, you know, uh, the baby came out and these hands was there. And they caught the child and they cut the umbilical cord. It was so peaceful. You know, there was no... Uh, like you said, there was no hoopla, and it was just, just a nice, peaceful bird, you know. Um, and uh, actually, the afterbirth was a lot worse than the actual birth, you know. <laughs> Jessica will tell you, you know. So, um, it, I, I mean, I'm just, I, I, I'm just so 
it, it, it's, it's, it's shocking. I tell you, it's, it's not shocking, but it's just amazing that God will bless someone like Randy Powell. You know, a sinner uh, since the age of what I can remember. I can remember I was out here uh, sinning, just sinning. Maybe I did not know better. And yet God still has had mercy on me, you know, in these things here. So in a time like these, you know, we just want to, I just want to, uh, just praise God just for blessing us and uh, just giving us another chance to truly find trust in Him in all things. In all things. You know, Dave? I'm just, I'm just happy about that. I just can't express that enough. So I just want um, I can go on and go on. But going where we see things are going, it says in, in hymnal uh, 92, this is my Father's world. It says, oh, let me never forget that though the world seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? Angela, would you like to lead us in this song? Thank you, man. This is my father's world, number 92 in your hymnal. Please stand. <clears throat>
for the privilege we have to come to this house of worship, to be together. There are congregations who still aren't meeting. There are congregations uh, who would love to meet. I pray that you will bless each believer as they worship you, the Creator, this Sabbath, wherever they are. And I pray that you will draw our hearts close together. We may social distance, but Father, let our hearts be in harmony and close with each other. Thank you. I pray these blessings and favors in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Randy, I was just about ready to uh, uh, add something to you. When you terminated this morning the, uh, uh, the words of praise, I just want to tell you, folks, you know I'm from La Vida Mission, and you know that's on the Navajo Reservation. Uh, there's two or three hundred thousand Navajos living in the Four Corners area, that's Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and a lot of them in Colorado. And it's been on the hearts of some of our people to witness to them. Adventist World Radio said we want to um, assist in, in the work of the gospel on the res. And so Adventist World Radio has partnered with the dozen or so churches around the res and groups and schools. And we're trying to have a 24-7, uh, 365, 100,000 watt FM station that belongs to the church. Um, we had bid on a frequency, uh, but the pandemic closed the bidding, and it hasn't been accepted or rejected, it's just waiting. Uh, meantime, we decided to start a pilot program, the Pacific Union. You know, the Navajo Reservation is on the end of the earth, the end of the Adventist earth. There are three union conferences, the Pacific Union, the Southwestern Union, and the Mid-America Union that have territory in the Navajo Nation. And there are four conferences. The Texaco Conference, the Rocky Mountain Conference, uh, the, Arizona, uh, the Arizona Conference, and the Utah Nevada Conference. So, being so peripheral to everything else, it's easy to be overlooked and ignored. And I praise God that some, for a hundred and four years, the Adventist Church has had an organized work on the res, but it hasn't gone as fast as we hoped, as it hasn't anywhere. And so we're looking to start the radio station, and Arizona and the Pacific Union came up with the money for a pilot. And tomorrow morning, Carol, what time? Tomorrow morning at 8.30, the first uh, radio broadcast by the group called Diné, that's their term for the tribe, it means the people. It's rather arrogant, as if there are no other people. But the May Adventist Radio will broadcast Sunday morning on the tribe's own. What, Carol? Yes, on KTNN, the tribe's own station. So please pray for that work. Uh, we. Don't know how God's going to accomplish it. Startup costs are estimated at half a billion dollars. Um, operations, annual operations, are estimated at $300,000.
but God owns a whole bunch of cows on a whole bunch of hills. Amen. And I think he owns the oil under those hills and, and everything else. And so we're stepping into the water in faith. Thank you. Today is for the local church budget that the deacons come forth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's our privilege and our duty to give these monies back to you, Lord. We pray that each dollar would equal a converted soul in your army. Be with us all, and in Jesus' name, help us to give cheerfully. Amen. You know, Jessica and Randy just had a new baby girl, and I'm going to tell you a story about a new baby boy. His name is Baby Moses. Yes, and here's a picture of Baby Moses, and he's gooing, and he's a happy, happy uh, baby. And here's his mother, and he's down. Here's his mother and his big sister Miriam, and here's his brother Aaron, and then thank God for baby Moses. Oh, <laughs> the baby started crying. Shh, shh, be quiet. No one's supposed to know you're here. We'll watch over you, and God will watch over you. You can see he's crying. Okay. Let me see. Uh, see? See the baby's crying? You can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, so 
that baby Moses starts growing and they can't keep the baby hidden any longer. So look at what mommy is doing. She's building a little boat to put in the river. See how she's building that boat for it to put the baby in? And the, ba and the basket's supposed to be a secret. And so here's mom, she's putting the, the baby in the, the river, and Miriam uh, is, is watching close by, and mom leaves. And they say a prayer, God, please watch over baby Moses, and don't you know God watches over you too. And so here, Miriam's hiding, and uh, then uh, she says, uh, oh, look, here comes the princess. And uh, she says, please keep baby Moses safe, please. Please send your angel to watch over Moses. And you know, you have an angel that watches over you, too. And uh, the princess uh, sees the, the boat and opens it up and she says, look, look, if there's a little Hebrew, Hebrew baby inside. And uh, the baby starts uh, crying. And, uh, Miriam rushes over and she says, princess, uh, I know a Hebrew woman that can help take care of the baby. And the princess says, Oh, that would be wonderful. Please go get her. So. And so here's a picture of the princess handing the baby to his mommy. And you can see he's very, very happy. <laughs> and uh, they say, thank you, God, for taking care of baby Moses. And you know, God takes care of you. Too. And, and we need to be sure and thank God for taking Mommy. care of us as well. So you could go back to your seats now. No. So good to see. One's enough. One microphone, I think, is, is enough at a time. It's good to see so many children in the church. I remember times when the only children we had in church were children that their parents did not come. We're so thankful that the children in the church, today, the parents are here. What a difference it makes. And I am just thrilled with all of these young folk. I'll tell you a story. The story about a pastor. He was a church of England, an Anglican pastor, wearing his clerical collar so everyone that saw him knew that he was a minister. He goes to the hospital to visit his wife. She's having a baby. He comes into the room, gives her a hug and a kiss, and they visit a while. He has prayer, and he gives her another hug and a kiss, and he leaves. It was only a few minutes after he left when the pastor's wife's roommate, there was two of them to the room, she spoke up and said, your pastor is a lot friendlier than mine. 
You know? Whether you're a pastor, married, or anyone else that's married, it seems like there's a lot of hugging and kissing going on. We're going to talk about a, a pastor, not a pastor, but a priest and his wife today, a, clear, a, 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 a clergy couple. They had been a clergy couple all of their life. For Zechariah was a descendant of Aaron. And every Jew that was a descendant of Aaron automatically became a priest. You could not become a priest unless you were a descendant of Aaron. But I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke, the first chapter. We're going to spend most of our time there, so once you get there, you won't have to be hunting all over the Bible to follow. So if I open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, and let us bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Our loving Father, as we once again open our Bibles, we pray that you'll open our hearts, lead us, and guide us to understanding. Is our prayer in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Starting with verse 13, we find Zechariah, the priest, having had the, uh, the lot drawn to do the, the service in the holy place that day. He's in the holy place of the temple. And suddenly he's startled. He is, he becomes afraid because standing on the right side of the altar of incense is this big angel. I've probably been afraid as well. So have you. Verse 13, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer is heard. What prayer? And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. Well, I know what they weren't praying for, for no one at that age is praying for a baby. They were praying for the Messiah to come. But in the process, they are told your wife Elizabeth will bear a will bear you a son, and you should call his name John. Elizabeth and Zechariah, like about 10% of the couples in our country, had no children. But then the angel told them they were going to. They're going to have one. And they were told what to call him. Let's drop down to verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I do For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in you. Well, he was trying to be very diplomatic there. He didn't call her an old woman. But angel, the angel said, Do you know who I am? I'm Gabriel. I'm the one who stands in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you these glad tidings and you don't believe me. Well, behold, you will be mute. You're not going to be able to talk. I'm going to give you silence for nine months. The angel gave Zechariah time out. Some of your parents have learned to use that time out with your children and you struggle for the first minute or two or three. Gabriel gave Zechariah nine months. 
of silence, of time out. Let's drop down to verse 21. And the people waited for Zechariah. They marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. And when he came out, he couldn't talk. He couldn't speak to them. He's, he's speechless. And they, they perceive, it says, it, that he had seen a vision in the temple. So verse 23, So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. And he and Elizabeth continued their hugging and kissing. And soon... Elizabeth was expecting a child after all these years. Now let's go down to verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered and she brought forth a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy, they rejoiced with her. There was a high five going on there. So it was on the eighth day they came to the temple to circumcise the child. And that's the day they would name the child. Then the believe people around said they're going to call him by the name of his mother, Zachariah. And, and his mother says, no, 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 no. His name is John. Here you see the shock and the surprise. Little you don't know anyone in your family by that name. There's no one of your relatives by that name. He needs to be named Zachariah. You find that in verse 61 and 62. So they went and said, we're going to go see Zachariah. Let's get his word. What, what he wants to call this baby that should be called Zechariah. So he made signs to his father, verse 62. This tells me another story, part of the story. The fact that they were trying to communicate with Zechariah who can't speak, he evidently can't hear either. When Gabriel gave him silence for six for nine months, he gave him silence. Couldn't speak either, evidently. So they made the signs to his father what he would have called him. This tells me, you know, that he's deaf. And he asked for a writing tablet. And he wrote down, his name is John. The Bible says, so they all marveled. But I love verse 40. 64. Immediately. His mouth was opened and his tongue loose and he spoke praising God. Oh my. It said fear came on all that dwelt around me. And all these sayings were discussed throughout the hill country. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have email. They didn't have cell phones. But they had something that we used to have when I was young. Tell a neighbor. Tell a neighbor. And it spreads pretty fast. It spread throughout the village. And fear came on all the dwelt around them. They wanted to know, verse 66, what kind of child will this be? As soon as Zachariah gave him the name John, he could speak after nine months of total silence. What kind of child is this? What's it going to be? And there's not a parent that hasn't looked at that little baby in their arms for the first time and sometimes wonder, what will this child grow up to be? Zechariah and Elizabeth didn't need to wonder. 
God had already told them what this child was going to be. Let's read it. Let's back up to verse 13 again. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. For your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And when he will turn, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord of their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the unjust. And now here it is. Here's the real mission of that child. It's right here. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. It was John's mission. This is our mission. This is our, our children's mission. The, the children that were here listening to the story and those in arms that weren't. It's their mission. This generation has been given the identical one line mission for this day. We are on the dawn of eternity. This is our mission. No matter how old we are or how young we are. No matter whether we have children at home or we're in the church with a lot of children, it's still our mission. It's the children's mission as well. Once you understand why your child is born. You will understand how your child is to live. Once the church understands why these children were born, the church will understand how we are to help these children in their mission. I have sitting up here some sheets that include a few things, including seven mentoring practices taken from the only thing we have left to do is to pray. There was a little five-year-old girl in the church with her mama sitting toward the back. Mama wasn't paying that close attention. She slipped out. She came up. She got a hold of the prayer mic. Put it to her lips. She looked up in the, into the sky. She said, Dear Jesus, thank you for the new church you're going to provide. What a change came over that congregation. What a change. From the life of John the Baptist. God, if you pass them out to those that want them. Uh, so that if they wish to follow along, there's all there except for one quotation that I have added since to this message. But there's eight or nine of them there for those that uh, want one, especially parents. Seven mentoring practices taken from the text we have been reading in Luke, the first chapter. Number one, parents must worship the giver of the child. It is one of the laws of parenting. 
You cannot pass on what you don't live out. Reading in verse 67 and 68, out of Luke 1, it says, Now his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Zechariah believed. Zechariah worshipped. Parents must worship the giver of the child. I believe every child that is born was wanted by God. There's a place for him. There's a job to do. And we will turn this thing off so it won't do that again. Apologize for forgetting to do that. Let me get it done here. Come on, get over there. There we are. Now his father praised the giver. You have to let your child see you worship the giver of the child. Worship God. If you want the child to have a relationship with Jesus, the child must see you having a relationship with Jesus. I had a beautiful PowerPoint available if you haven't got the ball in there yet. Because I wanted to show you a lovely story out of Cuba. A current story that's just happened in the last two years. There's a church up in northern Cuba, a little town called Gardenia, Cuba. If you remember, Elion, remember the little boy that got sent back to Cuba because his mother died while they were coming to the States to escape communism. He was from that town. And uh, at any rate, in this town, there was a Seventh-day Adventist church. The church crowded, can hold maybe squeezed in 50 people. They have over 200 people that attend regularly. So they had to make it so that they stood on the outside and watched and looked in and listened and during the church service. For 20 years they've been trying to get a new church. And every time it seemed that the state would not allow the permit. Something was always amiss. And it just kept going on and on. And finally, three years ago, 2017, there was a meeting with Maranatha and the church members. Again, the church was crowded as could be, standing room only, people all around on the outside of the building and looking in and Don Noble, the president of Maranatha was speaking and he said, we have tried and tried to get permits and we've been unable to accomplish it. There is, as a result, no money, no permission. We are unable to build a new church. And the church responded with a, he said, I never, ever want to witness this type of reaction. And he started crying and loud and bawling. Uh, how they, they were so unhappy that they weren't going to get a church big enough to worship God in all together. Finally, Don told them, 
The only thing we have left to do is to pray. There was a little five-year-old girl in the church with her mom, sitting toward the back. Mama wasn't paying that close attention. She slipped out, she came up, she got a hold of a prayer mic. Put it to her lips. She looked up in the, into the sky and she said, Dear Jesus, thank you for the new church you're going to provide. What a change came over that congregation. What a change. Instead of bawling, they started praying. Don Noble, the president of Maranatha, said, I believe God heard that prayer of that little girl. They prayed. It wasn't long until they got the ferments. And they built a beautiful church. I had pictures of it. It's two story. It holds 500 people in the sanctuary. They have room to grow. There's another 250 can be upstairs. They have all the electronics so they can watch and see and hear for an overflow crowd. Thousands of Seventh-day Adventists came to the dedication. There's 33,000 Adventists to the island of Cuba. And it's growing. And it's growing. A little girl, five years old, made the difference in that church. And it turned everything around. These little children don't underestimate the importance of these little children in the church. They're very important. And their understanding of their mission, their understanding is so important about God. Let's continue on. Parents, you have a mission. Your mission is to take that child, that little child, that little boy, that little girl, that little child has got to go from zero to eternity, and that is your mission. And until we're in eternity, that mission continues no matter how old your children have become. That goes for me as well. It's our mission. Number two, parents must declare the name of the child. Now, Zachariah and Elizabeth had God named the child. They were told by the angel what his name will be. And if you didn't ask God to help you name the child, ask God to bless you or the name you give him the child. So that child knows that name is God blessed. That's the name that the Lord wants. Parents, number three, must pronounce the blessing of the child. Verse 76, Zechariah says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. John's only eight days old. He doesn't understand a word that Dad's talking about. But Dad still pronounces the blessing on his child. Bless your children, parents. Pronounce the blessing on do it often. Number four, parents must focus on the Savior of the child. Verses 77 
and 279 we read, to give knowledge of salvation to his people. By the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. That's what Zechariah was telling. And that was what John was going to learn, the knowledge of the Savior. Parents must focus on the Savior of the child. If you focus on Jesus, and your child is focusing on you, everything will be okay. If you're focusing on Jesus, then it's all right. And they will focus on you. Donna Habernick wrote a book in 1994. She is a, a member of uh, the 7th Adventist Church in, in Berrien Springs. Her book is titled How to Help Your Child Really Love Jesus. There are six points from this book that I want to mention. But before I mention that, there's another lady, another another one of God's servants in Bering Springs. That's where Andrews University is. Her name is Brianna. She's the wife of a pastor. And I put it right in this for you if you need it. A website called DiscipleMama.com. I looked at it again this morning. If you have access to a computer, to the internet, and you're parenting, look that site up. It is filled with wonderful blogs and help from a pastor's wife who has little children of her own. But back to Donna Hubbard. Ha Hubbard. Donna Hubbard. She says in her, story, in her book a story about a six-year-old boy sitting out in, in, in church and there was a little break in the action uh, in, in the church service as we go from one little thing to another. And Unknown to Mama and Daddy sitting there, little Jonathan, that was his name, slipped out and he also came up and grabbed the, the prayer mic and he stuck it to his mouth and he looked up and said, Hi Jesus! The congregation laughed. Mom and Dad are trying to slide over the people. What was so wonderful about that? Six-year-old Jonathan, when he's in church, thinks Jesus is here. He gets it. He's got it. Do we have it? Hi, Jesus. Do you come to see Jesus here? Little six-year-old Jonathan did. These children, are we bringing them, expecting them to know Jesus is present? This is where they worship Jesus. Donna has six points in her book that I want to bring out. I've numbered them. Now these are separate from those other seven. Okay? Number one, show your children, this is from her book, How to Help Your Child Really Love Jesus. Show your children Jesus loves you through your own love. Hug your baby and say, Mommy loves you. And Jesus loves you too. Daddy loves you and Jesus loves you too. You have the child thinking of Jesus' love along with your love for the child 
I would hear this over and over. Number two, paint a friendly picture of Jesus. Instead of, oh my, how sad you made Jesus, emphasize a smile. Happy Jesus. How happy Jesus is with what you've just done. Have them think of Jesus as a friendly person. Number three is good. Encourage spontaneous conversation with Jesus. She says, Jesus, Christy feels so sad. Please help her to feel happy soon. Help! Have it so they understand they can talk to Jesus all day long. Growing up, hearing spontaneous conversation with Jesus. Number four, joyfully introduce Jesus through stories and pictures about his life. My Bible friends are still in print, and if you don't have a, a set of those, you may want to find a way to get one. The pictures are all full page, all in color, and the wonderful stories. It's a way for youngsters, little kids, to, to meet Jesus. And then take a picture, finally you can buy them in the Book of Bible House or in some of the other uh, Bible stores here in, in Amarillo or whatever. You may find a picture, a picture of Jesus surrounded by children. Hang that on the wall. Have them where they, uh, they can always look and see. Jesus loves to be around children. Put it in their bedroom. It's a suggestion. With number five, remind them that Jesus hurts when they hurt. They would love to take them in his arms and comfort them. Tell them Jesus can be their best friend, their forever friend who never abandons them. And then number six, which is the biggest in the most. The most important and impressive thing you can do is to show your children openly how much you love Jesus and they will learn to love him too. You parents must love Jesus first. Then they who look at you will love you. Church members, here with all of these children, they need to know that you love Jesus. And because you love Jesus, they can learn to love Jesus too. We need to be a part of this. Number five, now back to the seven. Parents must confirm the mission of the child. Oh my. From childhood, this is from the Desire of Ages. From childhood, his mission had been kept before him, and he had accepted the holy trust. Zechariah and Elizabeth kept that mission in front of John. Verse 76, a new child will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. And remember that one line mission to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And you say, well, my child is so small. What can I do to prepare a people for the Lord? What can they do? They're little. I put in a long quotation. It's a big paragraph. Here. And this is what is not in your sheet. I have added this. So please make a note under number 40. Please make a note to look up great controversy. The bottom paragraph on page 367. It continues on to the next page. I'm going to read it for you. 
You can look it up when you get home. It was God's will that the tidings of the Savior's coming should be given in the Scandinavian countries. And when the voices of the servants were silenced, he put his spirit upon the children that the work might be accomplished. Now I want, I want to read some more. When Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, attended by the rejoicing multitudes, there were shouts of triumph and the waving of palm branches heralded him as the son of David. The jealous Pharisees called upon him to silence them, but Jesus answered that all this was in fulfillment of prophecy. And if these should not hold their peace, the very stone would cry out. Then I've underlined this. The people intimidated by the threats of the priests and rulers ceased their joyful proclamation as they entered the gates of Jerusalem. But the children in the temple courts afterward took up the refrain and waving their branches of palm, they cried, Hosanna to the Son of David. When the Pharisees were sorely displeased with the sinner to hear us now what these say, Jesus answered, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfect praise? God has a plan for these children in the finishing of the work. We don't know what it is. But if they're brought up with this mission to prepare our people for the coming of the Lord, they will fulfill that mission. As God wrought through children at the time of Christ for Advent. Still reading from the great controversy. So he wrought through them in giving the message of his second advent. God's word must be fulfilled that the proclamation of the Savior's coming should be given to all people, tongues, and nations. These children may end up filled with the Holy Spirit speaking when adults can't do it. That's what God has in store. We're in the, we're at the dawn of eternity. The Lord will use even little children. Now number six, parents must seek the Spirit's baptism of the child. Black father, black son. Let's do the father first. Now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, so the Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and dropped down to verse 8. So the child grew and became strong. And I put him through thee. Let's read it with the way the Greek could read. So the child grew and became strong in the Spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Again from the desire of ages. Even the babe in his mother's arms may dwell as under the shadow of the Almighty through the faith of the praying mother. John the Baptist, now watch you to note this, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his birth. Have you been praying for the Holy Spirit to fill your child from its birth? It's never too young to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If we live in communion with God, we too may expect the divine spirit to mold our little ones even from their earliest moments. Randy, what was the earliest moment? What was the earliest moment? When that baby took a breath. Start praying for the Spirit to fill it from the earliest moments.
I have a question. So the child grew and became strong in the spirit and was in the desert. I put there the word wilderness. That's from the new international version. In the wilderness till the day of his manifestation to Israel. How can parents today create a wilderness environment for the children? That's the question. The answer is you control what comes in to your home. Whether your mother or father, somebody has to control what comes into the home. Wilderness suggests that less is better. I listed three things. I imagine you can add a bunch to them. I've only listed three. I know it's not exhausting. Number one is less screaming. Less screaming. Surely we have lived long enough to know that what gets streamed out in our homes are less and less morally fit for human consumption. And someone must be in control of what comes in to our homes. Someone. Is that you, Father? Is that you, Mother? Somebody must. There's so much in this streaming. Every one of these, every one of the teenagers today carry one of these. They can't get very long, very far without it. It becomes a crisis in our house when one of us has misplaced ours. We have to look until we find it. It seems like a ball and chain. We can't go anywhere without it. There's so much stuff on there not fit for human consumption. It's a real challenge today to raise children in this environment with all of the Wi-Fi everywhere available. It's a true challenge. You need the Holy Spirit to guide and to lead you. Now you're not going to like number two. I didn't like number two. Less sugar. Uh -oh. <laughs> now surely we've lived long enough to know that baby food is filled with sugar and surely we've lived long enough to know that the children's breakfast cereals are filled with sugar. But surely we also have lived long enough to know that adult food is filled with sugar. The sugar industry helps us all addicted to sugar. And you think, well, I'm going to have this little thing that's sugar free. I got news for you. When they take the sugar out, they put the fat in. Read those labels a little more. Nothing beats. Nothing beats the power of produce that you prepare. But it takes longer. And you control what goes in. Finally, less stuff. That seems like a pretty broad picture. Amen. Surely we've lived long enough to know that the toy industry, the technology industry, the consumer industry lives with the mantra that more is better. You've got to have more. Oh, yeah. That's not a wilderness. We need to have less. Listen. We need to have less. Less. Less sugar. Less toys. Less toys for adults. Less toys for children. Let's control that we don't just have more and more 
of this world in our house when we're trying to have our children be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Every day, let's take those children and let's pray to God to fill this little girl, fill this little boy with your Spirit, Lord, and fill me too. And that needs to be a daily prayer, not just once in a while. And no matter how young, the Bible says, and the Spirit of Prophecy tells us, John was filled with the Spirit from his birth. When he popped out of the womb, he was filled with the Spirit. There's never too young. John wasn't addicted on sugar. Gabriel told Zechariah, there was a lot of that stuff John was not to have. Most of what he talked about was alcohol. Today, he would talk about a lot of other things. He'd have two. There are some children that eat only one meal a day. God bless them. All day long. Every time that child wants something, food goes in the mouth. That's not the way the Spirit wants us to bring up the children. Not healthy. Not good. And if you eat it all day long, mm. if you're pumping in your mouth all day long, how do you expect the children to behave? They're going to be just like you. Now I'm sticking on my own toes, so <laughs> it, uh, there's certain things I like and I have a struggle with. But, Praise the Lord, I'm trying to get the victory. Jesus got the victory over appetite for 40 days, 40 nights in the wilderness. More than a conqueror. And through Him we can gain that victory. Amen. Jesus got the victory in seven hours on the cross over sin. And with the Him, him we can you know, come and we can gain the victory over sin. And so can our children. We need to live with the knowledge that our little ones will imitate us. And if that is so, then we must, we must imitate Jesus. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's what a parent needs we still have the message, the mission. This church has a mission. Each child in this church has a mission. Each parent in this church has a mission. And that is to make people, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's our mission. And from now till eternity. That is our mission. Amen. Shall we pray? Our loving Father, we thank you that you've given us this mission. That Jesus is coming soon. And Father, we pray that each one of us will take this mission to heart. Make it our mission. Make it our life's goal. Make it number one. To be filled with your spirit every moment of every day. That we may be a, a witness for you. Wherever we are. In our homes. In our work. When we go to the store. When we see others. Lord help us. Help us. To represent you. Is our prayer in Christ. Amen. You are
Thank you for viewing our videos. Hope this was for you and yours. Um, hopefully, please to like and subscribe to our videos and everything we have, every platform we have. Thank you. God bless.